Good evening, family and friends. We are now chapter 22, the last chapter of the Unmerited Favor Book of Pastor Pains. Yay! We're finished! Closing, ano na? Biro mo na ka, ano na? Eight book na tayo. So the title of the last chapter is The Secret of the uh, Beloved. Who is the beloved of the Lord? Us, right? Because we are in Christ. Remember the 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 verse in the in the New Testament where it says, um, the heavens the heavens the heavens opened when the Lord Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River and it, and Father God says, "This is my beloved Son, hear him." So tonight we will, as we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ more and more, as we grow into the knowledge of who He is, we will come to know who we are. Yan. So Father God, we thank you for tonight. We know that as the gospel that the gospel will be preached, Lord, our hearts will be um our hearts will come to know you more and more, and we will see transformation, Lord, from inside out. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you gave your son, your darling son, to each and every one of us so that we can live whole, we can live abundant life in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight. It's very important to have the correct theology because our wrong understanding of God's nature keeps us always searching and waiting. It keeps us asking God to do what he has already done. Israel had the, had the same problem. They didn't have a proper theology. They didn't have a proper uh, representation of God in their minds. They didn't have an accurate understanding of the nature of God. Therefore, they had forgotten he was their father. So God speaks to Isaiah and says in chapter 40, verse 18, To whom then you will liken God? Who is like unto thee? Diba yun yung kanta? Or what likeness will you compare to him? And he also asked it to Peter, Who do you say that I am? Theology is the study of God's nature isn't just for theologians or seminary students. It's for all of us. God is asking all of us this question, just like he asked Isaiah and Peter, Sam, who do you say that I am? Our answer is very, very important. Not because it's about giving the right answer and pleasing God, but because it locates us and allows God to begin revealing in us precisely who He is and said, and, and Paul said, it pleased the Father to reveal His Son in me. Abba gets great pleasure out of revealing Himself to us and in us. Because only as we have a proper foundation of who He really is, can we know who we are. Again, because only as we have a proper foundation of who He really is, can we know who we are. What a loving Father that He cares enough to ask us what He thinks He what He think He's like. Such a good Daddy, desiring for us to walk out the life He designed for us. He knows that if we don't have a correct theology or a correct correct perception or correct um, thinking about his nature. In other words, if you don't have an accurate image of him, we will continue to live far below the ori our original design. So he repeats his question to Isaiah in verse 25. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal? Hallelujah! And therefore tonight, I am convinced of better things concerning you, concerning all of us. It, because in Christ, in Christ, you and I have been made perfect. We no longer preach to the church repentance from dead works, lest we revive the old man. The world is not looking for the zombie church, but for the appearance of the risen Christ life. The world is not looking for some, you know, um, weirdos, weirdos, but for the appearance of the of the uh, of the risen Christ in each and every one of us we are convinced of who we are in Christ and we preach nothing less to you the bride of Christ the church than Christ in you that the church would live as nothing less than Christ has made her to be risen in him so if you are looking if you're asking for the purpose of your life 
here it is. Hear the great call on your life to come home from the weary fields of production and enter into the great feast of celebration that is participatory, that is participation in Christ's life, the life of rest. Hallelujah. So, because when he rose, the church rose. God's work is a masterpiece. You are God's poetry, Sam. You are God's poetry. But man's work is toil, poneros. We are his masterpiece created in Christ. The moment Jesus rose from the dead, a masterpiece was created out of Christ. If his creation was beautiful and created out of nothing, how much more beautiful are we, his creation out of Christ? When Christ rose, the church rose. When the, when the head rose, who is the head? Jesus, right? The body rose. The grace of God is the best teacher we can ever find. His grace enables us to look at him who looked at, uh, who looked at us with such love. We have thought that we need to worry if we, are, we, if we are serious about life. Our very seriousness is to rejoice seriously. To rejoice seriously because of our resurrection with Him. The Bible, the scripture says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. You know who is the joy of the Lord? The joy of the Lord is you. The finished work of Jesus Christ. Right? So seriously, you have to rejoice because you are resurrected with Him. The great majority of the Christian world is still weeping at the foot of the cross. The consciousness of man is fixed on the Christ who died, not on the Christ who lives. They're looking back to the Redeemer who was, not the Redeemer who is, sabi ni John G. Lick. Child of God, Church of Christ, again, you rose with Christ. So before, no, I, I've, uh, I've uh, alluded to this from um, last week. You know, si John G. Lake, he lived a life that um, that manifested the resurrection life of our Lord Jesus Christ when he uh, bravely confronted Ebola and bubonic plague. You know, parang COVID yun eh. Um, uh, left and right people were dying, but he went out helping out people. And literally, he was protected. He didn't die from, uh, he didn't die from, from Ebola. He didn't die from, from um, the bubonic plague. He, he helped a lot of people and he healed a lot of people. You know why? Because he said, we are awakening to that marvelous truth that Christ is not in the heavens only. Christ is not in the heavens only. You know where he is? He's in you. Nor the atmosphere only, but Christ is in you. And therefore, the manifestation of the risen Christ is, 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 is it's supposed to be an ordinary thing as you are walking here on earth. Heaven, you are heaven walking on earth. Yeah. So now I go to Genesis 2.17 because um, I think it's, it's a very important revelation. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You know that um, um, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it is associated with death. During first mention, with death. Rabbi Moses, uh, Rabbi Moses Ben Nachman de Rondi, known by abbreviation Ramban. Ano to famous to eh. Pastor Prince is mentioning him always. By the non-Jewish world as Nakam Nakamanides, he said, Perhaps it should be understood as on the day you eat from it, meaning the law, performance-based or religion, you shall realize that you are mortal. You have to live with the knowledge that one day you will die. A burden of awareness that no other creature bears. Tama nga naman, di ba yung mga aso? Wala silang context of, wala silang thinking that they will die. They're just living one day at a time. So, what is the most holy thing that we can do? What is the most rejoicing thing that we can do every day? That we live to the fullest each day of our lives. That we live the resurrection life that the Lord has given us. Hallelujah. Not thinking of any law, not thinking of death, but to live our lives full of the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. Diba na naaral natin to last week? And I think it's worth repeating again. In Genesis 3 verse 1 to 2. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord has made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The serpent didn't merely ask Eve if God said that she shouldn't eat of every tree. That would allow for a yes or no answer. 
And this verse in Hebrew is the word up, which in English was unfortunately translated as ye. But in Hebrew, it is two, two letters. It's aleph and in its kaf. This word in its ancient root is a picture of an ox or a mouth. It means to breathe heavy to the nose in passion or anger. Therefore, the serpent was breathing heavily and angrily at Eve and was saying it was it was an angry hiss that literally in Hebrew said, even if God said, do not eat from any of the trees of the garden, then it trails off into nothingness. In other words, the sentence has no end. It is just even if. So the, this term even if isn't absolute and allows for our personal opinion. And it enables us to conclude not based on what God has said, but on what we think. We do this today in the area of healing and provision. So the, the enemy, the serpent is saying, even if God said, by his stripes you are healed, you're still feeling the symptoms, right? Even if, if, if God said, I came to give you life and life more abundant, but still you see lack in your wallet, right? So even if God said that by his stripes you are healed, my experience says, the, the, the serpent is pointing out to you, say something different. Because even if allows for our subjective perspective. So we have got to stop listening to even if thinking in our minds. The mind of Christ, which is a real mind, has no even if thinking. It only thinks in absolutes of truth. What is, what is absolutes of truth? That you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You have resurrected with him and therefore you have the resurrection life of jesus christ in each cell of your body hallelujah multitudes of believers have been blinded by a reasonable gospel an unreasonable gospel is that when you do good you get good when you do bad you get beat in first corinthians 3 20 23 when men reason logically apart from the spirit of god religion is always the result because religion self-effort to the natural earthly man is the only reasonable way by which he can obtain the blessings of the life of God. As long as we cannot see that the grace of God clothe us when we were naked in sin, we will always try and clothe ourselves. That's why the work of the flesh, disputes, dissensions, factions start to abound where believers are trying to clothe themselves. When you can see what you already have, you will always start grasping, you always start envying other people. Multitudes of Christians has been blinded by a reasonable gospel. The only gospel with the power to open the eyes to the eternal realm, the resurrection life today is the one that sounds utter foolishness to the reasonable man. What is it? In Christ, all things, the gospel declares, in Christ, all things are already yours. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can they know them because they are spiritually discerned. In 1 Corinthians 2.14. And this is very well explained and expounded in John 5, 2-5, in the story of um, uh, the, the man paralyzed in the pool of Bethesda. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. Later we will study, because there's no word in, in, the, in the scripture, which is therefore just only filling up. Huh? It has meanings. So in this lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, <laughs> paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, then whoever stepped in first after the steering of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 long years. Can you see, can you see the, the scene here? Jesus wasn't on a stage. Jesus wasn't high up there, but he's there sitting with a paralytic. He's there looking at his eyes, conversing with him, talking to him empathizing with him infirmity in greek is asthenes which means to be weak or without strength it is the lack of strength or the inability to produce desired results depriving man, one of enjoying life this word can include sickness but it is also 
used in ma in a much broader uh, much broader way. It's a, it's a much broader word. It can apply to any area of our lives, our finances, our work, our studies, where we are weak or without strength and unable to produce the desired results of wholeness in our lives. So, so it also refers to physical, mental, emotional, in our relationships, and even in the financial or economic area. So this man was infirm. He was unable to produce the desired manifestation of the resurrection life or health in his life. Rather than enjoying life, he was confined to his mat, watching life pass him by. Waiting on his someday miracle. Oh, the best is yet to come, maybe tomorrow. Matt, the man was laying on waiting for the waters to be stirred. So, pwede mong, pwede ng ano, no? Yung Matt, maybe another time. Maybe another time. The pool had established a reputation of being a place of healing. Tradition said that occasionally an angel would come down and stir the waters and only the first one in the pool would be healed. In John 5 to 6, when Jesus saw, so Jesus saw, Jesus sees you and I. Jesus sees you and I. His eyes are always on you. Jesus saw him lying there and he knew that he already had been in that condition for a long time. He said to him, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? Jesus didn't say, would you like to be healed? But do you desire to be made whole? Do you desire to be made whole? In Strong's 5119 is defined as whole. The word whole as restored to health, healthy and sound. The word desire is present indicative, which means right now. The Lord is saying, do you want to be made well right now? In Greek, it is thelo, and it means will. To be determined. The mere Bible notes on this word saying to resolve desire. Not merely do you wish for something in the future, but it is this your desire right now? Because actually not all people want to be healed right now. They're thinking, ah, I can be healed next year or next week. Don't read into that having enough faith to get healed. Jesus is asking him if his will, his determination is to be whole. If this, is his de if this is his desire right now, or would he prefer to sit there on his mat? In other words, is he determined to he see himself as whole and complete or as someone infirm, unable to produce the desired results in his life, paralyzed from enjoying the abundant life? The Passion Translation says, do you truly long to be well? In its notes, it says also, are you convinced? That you are that you already that are you convinced that you are already made whole was he determined to abandon the way he has always been seeing himself that's not the same as do you have enough faith jesus wants to change his perception shift his understanding of how he sees himself so in john 5 a jesus said to him rise rise Take up your bed and walk. Jesus looked into this man's eyes, standing face to face, breath to breath, and simply spoke, rise, rise. Hallelujah. The word rise means to awaken, to awaken from sleep or death. Jesus said, wake up. It was resurrection language. One word from him produced in this man, the ability to produce result and it says he immediately picked up his bed and walked hallelujah hallelujah so jesus was asking the man he was read if he was ready to abandon how he had been seeing himself and simply be who he truly was whole and healthy then he told him rise take up your bed and walk in other words rise up and live the life I created you to live. Enjoy your abundant life. The word rise means to awaken from sleep or death. So it looks like this, no? Jesus looking at the eyes of the paralytic man. This man who had been inflicted for, afflicted for 38 years 
looked into the eyes of the master of wholeness and he saw his own reflection. We see our own reflection in the eyes of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must see ourselves from the eyes of our Lord Jesus Christ. He saw himself whole and he immediately awakened from out of his infirmity. He immediately awakened from out of his distorted sense of identity and he picked up his bed and enjoyed his abundant life. Hallelujah! Because you know what? Jesus said, I am willing. You know that his another name is willing. In Philippians 2.13 says, It is God who works in us both to will and do his good pleasure. What is his good pleasure? What is Sam? What is his will for you? Behold. Behold, his will and doing made this man whole. In Mark 1, the leper said to Jesus, If you are willing, you are able to cleanse me. If you are willing, you are able to cleanse me. The leper did, knows that Jesus is, is, is most powerful. But he had this doubt if Jesus was willing. T was capitalized in the word thelos. In, when you look at the interlinear, the word willing is thelos. When Jesus said, I am willing. Jesus is saying, I am willing. Willing is my name. Willing is who I am. I am never anything but willing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, he was the will <coughs> and the doing in this paralyzed man. When he said, rise and wake up, he released in this man the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, the living water. The man didn't need to get help to get in the water or wait for an angel to come and stir the water. The living water is both the will and the do that made him whole. The Spirit, the living water, transformed this man. At Jesus' word, at the willing, at the willing one in us, at his word of resurrection life, he says, rise. Awake to your righteousness. The result was immediate. The man was made whole. The man didn't, didn't need to get help to get into the water or wait for an angel to come and stir the water. The living water is both the will and the do that made him whole. Hallelujah! So, in John 5, 2, Now there is in Jerusalem by the ship gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. Jerusalem is Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim in Hebrew. It, it, it means God's dwelling place. Ayun palang ibig sabihin nun, no? In Zechariah 8.3, it is a compound word. The core word in this name is Shalem, which means peace or completeness and wholeness. And we've learned that Shalem and um, peace is being one with Him, right? The first part of Jerusalem is Yare. Diba? Naaral natin to. Ra'a. To see, meaning to revere, to pay heed to. In extreme cases, to fear, it is to inspire awe. One rabbi said, Yerushalayim can mean either <coughs> they will see or they will feel the awe. And when you put the first part together, you fully understand the name Jerusalem. They will see the wholeness. They will feel the awe of the completeness. Hallelujah. So, Zechariah 8 verse 3 said that it is called the city of truth. The word city is ir in Hebrew and means excitement. The, word, the root word is ur and it means awake. To open the eyes, truth is reality. Zechariah doesn't just say city of truth, but city of the truth. Awake to the reality. Awake to your reality, child of God. Awake to your truth and what it is, you are whole. You are complete. Hallelujah. When? Now. Today. Hallelujah. Bethesda means house of kindness. House of kindness. Shipgate is mentioned in Nehemiah. And it says that it was built near the, the tower of Hananel, which means God's favor or graciousness. The shipgate in Nehemiah was the first gate to be restored. It was also the only gate to be consecrated or set apart as holy. It was used for bringing in the lamb sacrifices for the temple. This was the gate the lamb walked through that day. And this kindness, and this house of kindness, this place of God's favor and graciousness had 
five porches, which is the number of grace and goodness. It is the letter He in Hebrew which represents revelation, light, and transforming power of the Holy Spirit. So, we read this story and we think only that this man was healed and Jesus left everyone else sick. I don't know about that. Scripture doesn't say everyone was left sick, but it doesn't say everyone was healed either. But you know what? In Luke 16, 19, it says he healed all. In Luke 5, 17, it says that the power of God was present to heal all, implying all that were there. And the mere Bible says that the very atmosphere was charged with power to heal. And so when we think about this story, let's daydream with the Holy Spirit and see everyone healed that day that was at the pool of Bethesda, the house of grace. You know, in another in, an, in another scripture, in John 7, 23, Jesus turned none away. Whatever their conditions, fevers, paralysis, deaf ears, or demonic oppression, he healed them all. He told to the Pharisees, are you angry at me? Because I've made a man every week whole on a Sabbath day. You are made every week whole from the top of your head down to the sole of your feet, child of God. Hallelujah. And in Deuteronomy 2.14, and the time it took to come. So this is now the story of the, I'm just relating it to the 38 years. The, time, uh, uh, the, the story of the Israelites when they were circling Kadesh Barnea. The time it took to come from Kadesh Barnea until we cross over the valley of the Sered was 38 years. Sounds familiar, right? Until the generation of the man of war was consumed from the midst of the camp, just as the Lord has sworn to them. 38 years infirmity. 38 years deprived of enjoying life. Why? They had sent spies into the land who came back with an evil report. They said, yes, it was just as God said, but we cannot take it. Yes, God said, by his stripes I am healed, but I still feel it. We are grasshoppers in their sight. Fear paralyzed them, resulting in their wandering in the wilderness, infirm, deprived of enjoying life for 38 years until an entire generation died. Like this man, Israel was stuck in a distorted, false sense of identity. They couldn't break free from their slave mentality even though they were 100% redeemed and free from Egypt and no longer slaves. A lot of us before. Now, praise the Lord, we are growing into the revelation of our wholeness in Him. Although we were we, we received the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we for, for a long time, we had this distorted identity of ourselves. We, we remained to be slaves in our mentality, but now no more. We don't see ourselves anymore as grasshoppers. So because a false distorted identity causes us to be paralyzed and not to possess our promised land, our inheritance, even though it's already fully paid and fully ours. I don't think the children of Israel thought they would wander in the wilderness for 38 years when they came back with an evil report. Maybe like this man, they thought someday we'll go in. Maybe another time when, when we're stronger or better equipped. But the promised land, inheritance, required a new mindset, a renewed mindset, a generation who knew they were free, who knew that it is finished, tetelestai, child of God. And I'm telling, you, I'm telling this also to myself. We don't need to get healed. We simply need to rise up in the revelation that we were healed 2,000 years ago. We don't need to get healed. We simply need to rise up to the revelation in the revelation that we are healed 2,000 years ago. Hallelujah. Tetelestai, it is finished. Because we have the mind of Christ and can fully possess or walk in the experience of all our inheritance. In Ephesians 4.23, in the mirror. Thus, you are habitually renewed in your innermost mind. This will cause you to be completely reprogrammed in the way you think about yourselves. Ponder the truth about you as it is displayed in Christ. Begin with the fact of your co-seatedness. You can never be more co-raised and co-elevated than what you already are. 
Ephesians 2, 5 to 6, you can only grow in your awareness of your redeemed oneness. Notice that Paul does not say renew your minds, but to be habitually, continuously renewed. He uses the present passive infinitive. Anan neostai, from Anna upwards by setting your mind on things above. Mirror notes, this transformation happens in the spirit of your mind, awakened by truth on a much deeper level than a mere intellectual or academic consent. We often thought that we had to get information to drop from the head to the heart, but it is the other way around. Jesus said in John 7, 37, when you believe that I am what the scriptures are all about, then you will discover that you are what I am all about. And rivers of living waters will gush out of your innermost being. Therefore, we need an uh, we need a, a habitual renewal. We need a revelation of our wholeness. Hallelujah. First Peter 1 Peter 1.13. Therefore, ito importante ha. Geared up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know what the loins of your mind is? Thoughts that are hidden from view. Minds are covered even from our own view at times. They aren't, they aren't the close to the surface thoughts, but deep thoughts that we don't often realize are there. Loins are where the reproductive or procreative power resides, producing desired results. In the mirror, how amazing is that Jesus is what the scripture are all about and you are what Jesus is all about now. Wrap around your minds around that. This unveiling is what tied up all the loose ends that would trip you and frustrate your seamless transition from old to the new. The revelation of Jesus is no longer a future expectation. Do not allow the old mindset of a future tense glory to intoxicate you and distract you from the relevance of this moment. Stop pointing to a future Messiah. Jesus is who the prophets pointed to. Fully engage your minds with the consequence of this grace in the revelation of Jesus Christ. He completes your every expectation. And therefore, you can bravely sing. You can confidently sing. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. Diba yun yung, yung kanta na super anointed? So, in verse 14 of John 5, Jesus, it, it's super heartwarming. After he healed the, the paralyzed man at the Bethesda pool, in verse 14 of John 5, Jesus meets, with, uh, with, meets up with this man again. Where? In the temple. And he says to him, See, you've been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come, come upon you. Most of us were probably thought to read this to keep your behavior and in check or something worse than paralyzed will happen to you. But it's better in the mirror. See, you have become whole. Do not continue in your old distorted mindset, which is sin. Sin is separation, di ba? Then nothing worse can happen to you. Do not allow your distorted view of yourself set in again. But see... The mirror. Who is the mirror? Jesus Christ. Jesus is not telling him that if he sins or continues in wrong behavior, he will be punished and become sick. That was old covenant thinking. He's telling him that sickness has its origin in our soul. It is not connected to sin, not behavior, but to a false, distorted sense of identity. So it says afterwards, Jesus finds him in the temple and says to him, Jesus found him in the temple. Afterwards, he finds him in, in the temple. That immediately should, makes a th- should make us think that this is now talking to us. Where? Who is the temple? Who is the temple, Sam? Bio. You! And Jesus is what? Today is in you. We are the temple. He made us his soul. He made his home in us. He lives in us and he still says to us, and he, and he still says to us, to us in us, see you have become or been caused to be ginumay, whole. No more sin, no more living with a false, distorted identity. He caused us to be whole, finished. Why did Jesus say sin no more so nothing worse happens? Wrong, distorted identity can cause us to become something else. As man, as a man thinks in his heart, 
so is he. We are still whole because that's our, our, our reality. Our wholeness is finished. But our experience can change because of a distorted perception of who we are. And our experience becomes our perceived reality. That's not to cause fear or think we have to manage our thoughts or do anything, but just to make us aware that our thoughts, our mindsets are important. But it is a life of co-participation with Him, co-participating from the realm of finished, knowing we are co-seated and resting with Him. And in Luke 6.45, it says, As a good man, a good man out of the good treasures of his heart, bring forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart, bring forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. His mouth speaks. The word brings forth is propero and means to bring to necessary manifestation. How do you bring it to manifestation, your wholeness? Through the confession of your mouth, homologio. It is to produce the desired results. It's hearing him say, rise, awaken. And what do you say? Yes. Hearing him say, see, you are whole. And you say, amen. We may not understand completely, but our heart's response is yes, amen. This is who I am. Why? Because our perceptions, our beliefs, which create our experiences, which creates our reality. Hallelujah. And therefore, now we go to the, uh, uh, the communion. Remember this, this scene, yung seating arrangement? The two most honored seats at the meal were those at the right and the left and, and the left of the host or the master. That means the disciple whom Jesus loved, who rested his head on Jesus' bosom, an act of deep concern, love, and intimate friendship, was sitting in a position of honor at that meal. Likewise, for Jesus to be able to give Judas the sock, he too was sitting very close to Jesus, possibly in the other honored position. Correct? In John 13, 23 to 25, now there was there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. John knew and he named himself Beloved, child of God. You're also God's beloved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. The, then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said, Lord, who is it? John the Beloved leaned his head on Jesus' breast, not just hearing the voice, but hearing his heart. What a beautiful picture of hearing heart, of a hearing heart, or Shema in Hebrew. The word we translate obedience. He was knowing the voice and the heart of the one who lives as us. John didn't just hear, he intimately leaned into the voice. John leaned against him, cuddled up in his love. The voice became his voice. The voice became his voice, oneness. So, the ancient Hebrew word for the Greek verb lean or recline is engraved or pen. The, the voice was engraved in John. It was etched or carved in him from before the foundation. Leaning into the spirit allowed that engraved voice to give language to John's voice flowing through his pen. One voice, one life flowing in, us, and through John. So, during that time, yung soap, right, it simply means a small portion, a morsel, or a, prog, uh, a fragment. In Bible times, it would have been a common dish as, at the meal. Their bread was flat, thin, and round. It was, a very com it was very common to dip a piece of bread into the common dish, wrap the bread around a small piece, piece of food, a soap. But when the host, si Lord Jesus, no, he was the host, would dip his piece of bread into the dish and then give the soap to, to someone that was very, very significant. So see the way the Lord Jesus looked at his disciples. He honored them, right? Even Judas, right? He honored, he honored Judas. He even gave him the seat of honor. The host or the master of the house would give the soap to the person to whom he wanted to show his greatest love and esteem. Up until the very end, the Lord Jesus loved Judas. He honored him. He thought of him, his thoughts of him are of good, right? He did that by dipping into the common dish and then placing the soap into the person's mouth. In doing that, he would show to all those present and to the person receiving the soap, the love and honor he had for him. 
today, child of God, this is who you are. When we partake of the communion, right, we have to see ourselves how precious and how loved we are. Judas didn't see himself that way, right? He he saw himself the opposite. But Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me because I want you to remember my love. Remember the young man's father would take a flask of wine. He would pour a cup of wine and hand it to his son. The son would turn to the young woman, the young woman who is the bride, and with all the solemnity of an oath before the Almighty God himself, that young man would take the cup of wine and say to the young woman, This cup is a new covenant in my blood which I offer to you. In other words, I love you. I am your faithful husband. You are my bride. Hallelujah. And therefore, the Lord is saying to you, His bride, Arise from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. Rise to a new life. Shine. Be radiant with the glory of the Lord. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. In Isaiah 60 verse 1. Isaiah is talking about a resurrected, glorified, fully redeemed bride of Christ, new creation in Christ, the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ. And in Christ, we have risen above our circumstances, and we radiate with the glory of the Lord. And that, my dear family and friends, is chapter 22. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.